Hello, Facebook fam. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Look, I'm excited that you are joining me. Those that are joining live, those that are joining the replay, this is going to be a powerful conversation because we're going to be talking about the prophetic. We're going to be talking about healthy prophets versus unhealthy prophets, healthy prophetic versus unhealthy prophetic. Many of you who have a prophetic call in your life, you are interested uh, in the prophetic anointing, you are diving into prophetic revelation. Perhaps some of you are already having dreams, visions, encounters, experiences. Uh, we're going to give some language to it, but we're also going to give you some instruction because one of the things I think that happens to us when we have a prophetic mandate on our lives is we begin to have experiences, but we perhaps don't have the language or the understanding. This is why a number of years ago I got involved in prophetic training because I wanted to be able to assist people like yourself on your prophetic journey so that as you are going forward, as you are uh, being activated, you have understanding of how the Lord is using you. And I think oftentimes one of the reasons people fall into what I call prophetic pitfalls is they just simply lack training. And so we're going to talk about this. I often say that, you know, when you get a prophetic person without a good understanding of their gift, good understanding of their operation, uh, it can be a bit like spraying machine gun bullets. They can be having revelation. They can be having encounters. They can be having experiences, but those experiences may not be coming forth in a healthy way. So this is why we want to study. This is why we learn. One of the things that helped me so much. Good morning, everybody. Hey, let me know where you're joining me from. I don't know why I'm having problems on my Facebook app on my phone, but I do see the chats coming up here uh, on my live view. So as you're coming on, if you want to let me know where you're joining me from, I would love that. One of the things that helped me so much personally in my prophetic journey is when I began to get around people who had understanding of the prophetic. And some of that was reading books. It was taking courses. It was getting involved with the prophetic community at large in the body of Christ. You know, a lot of you, hey, Texas in the house, San Antonio, Tallahassee, Florida, good morning. A lot of you may be struggling like so many people that write to me and you say, there's not a prophetic church where I live. I don't know how to find prophetic training. I don't understand uh, this thing the Lord's called me to do. We're going to give you some insight today. So welcome. I see New York City in the house. I see Virginia in the house. God bless you. Great to see you. So excited that you are here. Illinois is in the house. Uh, God bless you. Uh, please do me a favor if you would and just click share. If you'll share this broadcast, that would be a blessing to us. I want to mention to you, I'm doing something that many of you have participated in the past. I'm having my annual prophetic school and I'm doing it totally different this year in a way I've never done it before. That's called LG, um, that's called SPI, Sears and Prophets Intensive. Uh, New York City, Waco, Texas, good morning. That is coming up April the 28th through the 30th. It's going to be powerful. The thing I'm doing, I've never done before, I'm doing it live. So every morning, every evening of the 28th through the 30th, there's a live session. There's some bonus options. One of the bonus options is a Q&A that I will be answering your questions if you're one of the students. Uh, now, many of you are in different time zones. I'm looking at the people who are on this live right now. You're in other nations and you say, well, I can't be there for your time zone. You're going to get a replay option as well. So that's going to be very, very helpful. Uh, what you need to do, hello, Apostle Chaz and Strickland, what you need to do if you want to be a part of this, you need to go to www.lgi.institute, www.lgi.institute. My admin is posting that in the comments. So you literally can copy and paste that. And it is going to be a phenomenal round of training. My guest will be Apostle Jennifer LeClaire, Prophet Taurus Solomon, who's on with me this morning. I'm going to introduce in a moment, Prophet Shalonda Perry. I've chosen this panel because in addition to myself, uh, each of them brings something different. Jennifer has had a long, long track record of writing some of the best-selling books on the prophetic that have ever been written and on spiritual warfare. So I've asked her to teach on effective prophetic warfare because if you're prophetic, you're going to have warfare. You're going to have battles. You're going to have attacks and you can wage warfare effectively or ineffectively. So I want to bring to you wisdom to help you wage effective prophetic warfare. Prophet Taurus, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, is probably one of the best equippers I know of. The way the verbiage he uses, the language he uses will bring absolute clarity to your prophetic calling and function. And then 
Prada Shilana Perry came into my life a number of years ago. She's a spiritual daughter. At the time God brought her across my path, she was prophesying, she was preaching, she was activating. But then God took her in a whole nother pathway of entrepreneurship. And she's one of the top uh, earners and achievers in a group of health coaches. And she has been really, really doing powerful things in that arena. So she has sort of merged together the prophetic and entrepreneurship. Uh, and it has been a phenomenal journey with her. And this particular SBI, we're calling it the solutionist edition because my premise is this, is if you are healthy in the prophetic, you're going to be a part of the answer and the solution, not the problem and the issue. So this group is going to be bringing that. I'm going to be teaching on prophetic entrepreneurship, two sessions, never done that before. I'm very excited about it. I'm going to be really, really looking to activate you, give you some insight, give you some wisdom. So it's going to be powerful. The only thing missing is you. You got to go to www.lgi.institute to register. Also, let me say, this is the least expensive prophetic school I have ever done. Part of my strategy with this is to lower the bar for you to make access very easy so that as many people as possible can be a part of this. All right. I'm excited for my conversation. He is the founder, the leader of uh, Taurus Solomon Ministries. He's a creator. He's an author. Uh, he's an apparel uh, designer. He's got some really interesting apparel with deliverance and therapy logos and other things, and it is going to be powerful. I want to welcome him to the platform now, Prophet Taurus Solomon. Good morning. All right, let me see. I think there we go. Uh, hold on. I muted you again. Okay, there we go. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. Listen, I'm excited about this. You and I Me were too. in a uh, we were in a conference in Virginia and you were teaching on prophets in the local church. And of course, it's a subject I've heard before, but it was literally one of the most masterful presentations I've ever seen oh, uh, about prophets in the local church. But the thing is, you are part of a local church here in Atlanta. Your God is taking you to Texas uh, in this season. And you you activated, you trained, you talked about uh, the prophets there. So what was your journey like as a prophet linking, I'm a prophet, but I'm also a part of building and planting churches. How did that come together for you? Well, uh, I was about 19 years old. I started first prophesying at uh, seven years old. So I had a very interesting prophetic journey as a child learning to hear the voice of God. I grew up in a very spirit filled holiness, apostolic church environment. So we learned um, the things of the spirit, but we didn't have the the very nice prophetic classes that you offer. We didn't have those. I had a grandmother who would tell me when I was off, when I was on, when I was right, when I was wrong. She was, she, and it was in front of the church. Sometimes I would stand up and prophesy at 12 years old. And she would say, that's not God. He did not say it. You need to go back to your prayer closet. You know, I don't recommend that <laughs> most people go through that type of training and development. It was very direct. Sometimes I was embarrassed, but it prepared me uh, for the ministry that I have now. I was about 19 years old in college and I was drawn to this church planter and I did not understand why I was drawn to his church planter. I came from a very structured organization, very clear lines, very clear expectations, very clear lines of delineations between titles. And so for me to be drawn to this church planter, I was confused. And the Lord spoke to me at 19 and he said, I've called you to be a Nathan. Your mm -hmm. life I've called you to be like Nathan. And I was just like, Nathan, everybody gets to be Elijah. Everybody gets to be Ezekiel. They get to see the, the wheel in the middle of the wheel and call down fire from heaven. And you want me to be Ezekiel. And it began to give me a, a, a hunger to study um, the Nathan, uh, Nathan type prophets. And I found there are similarities between Nathan and Joseph and Deborah and Gad and Daniel. And I'm like, OK, so this isn't just. But this isn't just a, a, a one time fluke type prophet. This is something that is indicative a lot of times to uh, the prophet's call to be one who walks with people who build. And then um, I, I played around with that. And then in about 2015, I started feeling that urge again to to help a church planning organization. And the Lord clarified it for me again. I know you like to do the deliverance. And I know, but your, mm -hmm. the strength of your call is to help builders build the right way. 
Yeah, and I love that example. You know, one of the things I look at scriptures like Ephesians 2.20, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with, the foundation of the church built upon the apostles and prophets. And I completely believe in people who presented this theory. Hey, that's talking about, you know, the foundational apostles and prophets. I believe that, but I also believe that there is uh, a living expression of that scripture, that it's dealing with those gifts being foundational. Then I look at allegorically in the Old Testament, um, you know, re rebuilding the walls. And you look at Nehemiah and Nehemiah says the one that blows the trumpet, which is the type and shout of a prophet was mm -hmm. by me. And I think there's always this link up. Now, interestingly enough, I think it can be very frustrating and there can be a lot of tension between builders and prophets because sometimes depending on the makeup of a builder, sometimes as builders, we are very vision driven. And I have found in my own life, I'm a bit different because most of what I build has a pretty heavy dose of the prophetic in it. But I found for me and then for friends of mine who are maybe a lot more logical than I am, that sometimes there's a clash with prophets because prophets will present something that's uncomfortable to the builder, make the builder feel like this, is you're slowing me down, you're delaying me. And so, so I think even as a prophet, or a prophetic believer in that type of atmosphere, it, it can be a bit of a struggle. Um, have you found that in your journey? And if so, how did you navigate that? And how can people watching this navigate that space? It's probably one of the most uncomfortable parts of my call to um, be called to help someone that doesn't always know how to accept your help or doesn't know how to uh, receive what you're saying. It's, a, it's the reason that a lot of prophets have fled from the church and run into the marketplace and are, are just a burnout with church and are done with church because there's a part of um, our wiring, we, we have to feel like we're being heard. And so what I've learned to do is train myself and other prophets to be able to give the word, give the instruction, but give it from an advisor position. You're not a decision maker, you're an advisor. And being an advisor means that I still have to give the decision maker the opportunity to make the mistake. And when he makes the mistake, I have to be uh, humble enough and meek enough to say, you know what, you didn't listen to me, you did what I told you not to do, we made a mistake, but I believe the Lord has given me a strategy to help us out of this. Uh, it's been one of the most difficult because um, uh, apostolic builders are very, like you said, mission driven. They are, they are stubborn. They are, uh, <laughs> I don't want to use too many colorful words, but they are often difficult when they have a, because. but that's how God wired them. Their function is to come up against opposition, to plow through new territory, to, to tear up the unfamiliar and to create something new. So they're, they're used to confrontation. And when you have somebody who's all gas on a V8 engine, uh, not, we're not talking about electric cars. I'm talking about a V8 vroom vroom engine apostolic builders are. And then you have a prophet who comes alongside and starts adding uh, the steering wheel and the brake system to, to somebody who's all gas, um, it becomes uncomfortable for them because they feel like, are you with me or against me? That's the first thing mm. that unhealthy apostolic leaders begin to ask. <laughs> when you start challenging mm. their ideas, you start challenging their um, perspective, you start challenging their pace, they begin to ask, are you with me or against me? And it's just like, I'm definitely with you, but my loyalty is first to God. And so when you have leaders that aren't willing to uh, or don't understand, fully understand the value of the prophet, then you, you start having that classic pastor or apostle prophet tension. Mostly, mostly it's pastor prophets. I found that apostles are, are usually uh, a little easier to work with. But I think pastors and prophets are on the opposite end of that fivefold spectrum. <laughs> so when they're trying to build and 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 shepherd the sheep and the and the prophet is is with them building but also trying to stay true to the supernatural culture that that god has designed for that location or that church then you you run into some issues and and, and for for new prophets and for uh, unhealthy prophets this type of relationship can seem like an abuse instead of assignment but it's really one of the most powerful um, molding mechanisms that God can put a prophet in, especially if you're called to be with builders, you're going to have to walk alongside somebody who is um, disgusted at your prophetic perspective. <laughs> wow. It wow. Molds. Wow. So I, you said so much, but I want to go, 
I want to bring it to the prophets and then we might circle back to pastors and apostles because I agree with everything you said. But I, I titled this video today, Healthy Prophets versus Unhealthy Prophets. So you started by talking about training. I can remember in my own journey, um, I was uh, prophetic but didn't know it. So I was raised in a non-Christian home and I was not going to church. All of what we're talking about was off my radar, but I would have dreams. I would see things. Now, as a child, as an early teens uh, person, I would be seeing a lot of negative things. So my dreams would be nightmares. There'd be a lot of demons. We didn't know, I didn't know they were demons, but these, this is what I was seeing until um, I got saved. And so through that process, then I joined a local church. It was a small local church. This was in the days of the Word of Faith movement. It was really, really going strong. So this is more of a faith-filled church. The only prophetic people were that were there uh, were like the intercessors. So I'm having these experiences. I'm having these encounters, but I have zero training whatsoever. And to make a long story short, that would be my journey for years, even going off to Bible college. Uh, it was there wasn't a class for prophets. There wasn't training for prophets. So it would be years and years of me praying, seeking the Lord, learning bits and pieces. And then way later in my journey, getting in prophetic communities and learning from people and having to really, if I'm being frank about it, play catch up on a lot of things. And so mm -hmm. I personally had a lot of unhealthy prophetic tendencies because there was a lack of training. That was yes. one of my big, big issues. But and you touched on that one. So I want to go forward from there. And let's talk about for people that are watching this uh, differences between being a healthy prophet or prophetic person versus unhealthy. Walk us through some of that and give us some wisdom there. Yeah. You know, unhealthy prophetic people, we have to. So we have to be able to distinguish between unhealthy prophets and false prophets, because sometimes we run into authentic prophets who are just unhealthy. They're called by God from their mother's womb. They got the same declaration and, and mandate that, that Jeremiah did, but because they have been um, in dysfunctional church environments, dysfunctional family environments, um, any type of dysfunction, they have wounds in their soul. So unhealthy prophets look like um, so prophets, healthy prophets, as I've described, are people who are designed to build, who are, decide, who are designed to help, to set foundation, order, and build up. Unhealthy prophets are, are negative. They tear down. And one sign of an unhealthy prophet is that all they do or their, their major lean is to negativity. They always want to bring words of judgment. They always want to bring words of correction. They always want to bring words of death. They don't want anybody uh, to experience uh, any type of, they don't know how to help people experience the positive side of following God. They just come to be deep and spooky. I have found unhealthy prophets are the ones who make deep, who do the deep looks and make um, deep but not so profound um, um, statements all the time. If they always trying to mm. seem like they in, in the spirit, it's because they're trying to hide something in the natural. Um, mm. uh, uh, unhealthy prophets are often full of offense and they live as victims. You have to be careful because the plan of the enemy for prophets is to make them withdraw. He wants prophets to live in the cave and be stuck in the Old Testament paradigm where prophets would come and prophesy and give the word of the Lord. And this is what God said, whether you like it or not, and then go back to their cave. But in the New Testament context, prophets get to prophesy the word of the Lord in the same manner. But they now have to say Stay with the people and go through with the people. If judgment is coming, you don't get to go to your cave and avoid judgment. If God called you to that community, you have to stay in that place and be solutionists. Be, be ones that bring reconciliation. Be ones that bring answers in the community that you just declared destruction on. I have a problem with unhealthy prophets who would call uh judgment over a church or declare or declare you know ichabod over a place and then leave no if god is literally if god has said something to you about a church that you're assigned to why don't you come up with the solutions it's easy for prophets to identify the problem but the strength of mature healthy prophets is they bring the solution that's why i love that you're calling this uh the solutionist edition of sears prophets prophets in the institute because um healthy prophets promote reconciliation unhealthy prophets live in mm. offense they become the victim um unhealthy prophets love isolation and paranoia 
Their unhealthy profits are often uh, um, afraid that someone's after them. They're overthinking what people think about what they say, how people perceive their words. They overthink how people how people receive what they've called them to do. They, they are, um, they're constantly living in the place of, I have to protect myself. Healthy prophets though, have a, have a, um, a, a healthy perspective of leadership and prophetic communities. If you see in the Bible, um, prophets were not developed one-on-one. -on -one. We love to talk about the Elijah Elisha uh, scenario because that's what a lot of people want. They don't feel like they can be developed unless they have one man of God who's going to lord over my life and, and throw his mantle on me and give me what I need in order to become a good prophet. But no, traditionally, scripturally, Prophets were trained in groups. They were trained in schools. They were trained um, in communities. So unhealthy prophets resist community. They love isolation. They resist community. Healthy prophets benefit from healthy community and leadership. I want you to pay attention to this because this is what's going on right now in these Facebook streets, on these Instagram lives and all these YouTube uh, live videos. We see unhealthy prophets utilize their gifts for selfish reasons. Mm. Unhealthy prophets utilize their gifts for selfish reasons. If you want to find a prophet who is unhealthy, you need to find a prophet who's only prophesying for his gain, for his benefit, because he wants to see, he or she wants to seem um, powerful. He or she wants to seem relevant. He or she wants to seem like someone who has the anointing, who has who has uh, the only ability. They'll use their gift to get affirmation. I used to have a friend who was a true prophet, but I would notice every time he would get around someone new, he would start prophesying to them. And the, uh, the Lord began to reveal to me that his motive in prophesying was for them to cling to him, for them to accept him, for them to... Um, like him. And the Lord began to give me a revelation on how oftentimes you don't see prophets prophesying for, for man's affirmation. This is why a prophet is not honored in his own home, Jesus said. It's because the foundation of a prophet's ministry was never designed to be built on the affirmation of man. So when you find prophets who have um, who thrive off of the affirmation of man, who thrive off of um, getting accolades and recognition um, and and they begin to get influence behind that, then you'll find a prophet who also maybe carry maybe carries the orphan spirit. And it's dangerous to give orphans influence. There's a scripture in the New Testament where John was talking about one of the leaders in the church. His name is Diotrephus, and Diotrephus was one who loved preeminence, and he resisted John, and he resisted the other apostles coming to that church. Some theologians believe that he was a, the pastor of that church, but John says that he resisted the, uh, the brethren, and he was unhospitable and did not welcome them because he loved preeminence. When you see a prophet who, who has an orphan spirit, they become very opportunistic. They become very um, money-driven, title-driven. They become um, they become very um, uh, self-centered, and they'll begin to use the gift. Now, prophets do have an anointing to command blessing and call things that were, that were non-existent into existence and call things that were dead into life. But when they become selfish, they only use that for their benefit, their gain. They prophesy only if you give me a dollar. That's a sign of an unhealthy prophet. They don't have healthy souls. Healthy prophets are healthy humans. This is why prophets still need pastors, apostles, mentors. They need to be discipled because if your soul is unhealthy, that gift, that gift is in your spirit. It's going to be there no matter what. But if your soul is unhealthy, then it's going to taint the gift. Mm. And I think that's such a huge thing. I remember I did a, a training a while ago called the prophetic mind. And we talked about mm. the mental side of prophets and really dealing with that. And as you're sharing, I can see so many, so many things. And I hope the people that are watching this on replay or live that y'all are taking notes. I love that point about prophesying for opportunity. I remember there was somebody in my apostolic network some time ago that every time 
they were invited into a space with a leader. They would find a way to give the leader a prophetic word. And the Lord began to spotlight to me, this was not only a need for affirmation, but it was also trying to prostitute their gift to open doors. So if they mm. saw somebody that had a church and they wanted to come preach in their church, they prophesied them. If they saw somebody that had influence and it got so bad that if they were in a green room at an event of mine or somebody else's, as soon as you walked away and left them, they would go find uh, the most well-known speaker or they would find somebody that had influence and they would start to prophesy to them. And so I literally pulled them aside and said, listen, there's a pattern here that you're utilizing the space that you're in for family as opportunity and prom self-promotion. If God has a word for that person, that's fine. But you also have to be very careful about your motive. And I believe one of the things when we judge prophecy is we're judging the motive behind the prophecy. Oftentimes when people have given me prophetic words and I have felt that the word was off, one of the major things that helped me discern that was the motive behind the word. You know, I remember somebody gave me a word years ago when I was uh, really first starting the ministry. One of the gifts the Lord gave to me was the working of miracles, the gifts of healings. And so people would get healed often. And a person came to me and gave me a prophetic word. And they said, God said, you're going to be the greatest healing minister of your generation. And your ministry is going to be bigger than so-and-so's. This was a leading healing person. Immediately, I knew that word was off because God's not going to like tear somebody else down mm -hmm. to lift me up. And I could discern the motive behind that was flattery. They were trying to flatter me. I don't, this is the thing. I don't know that mm -hmm. they knew that was their motive. Sometimes if you're mentally and emotionally unhealthy, you don't recognize this. Is why First Thessalonians or Thessalonians rather teaches that we're spirit, but we have a soul. I believe the soul is defined partially by the mind, will, and emotions. So I like to teach that the soul is the filter. One of the mm -hmm. things we don't deal with a lot of times as prophets and prophetic people is the filter of our mind. I, I had a young prophet that I knew who went on to a quite well-known platform in ministry, but I began to see how he would release prophetic words. And oftentimes he would release prophetic words in a way that made me feel very uncomfortable. He would have a dream about a famous celebrity or politician or something like this. And he'd immediately go to Facebook and you know other platforms as well without any kind of wisdom, without any kind of cons consultation. Now, why would that be the case? There are different levels of the prophetic. You might remember with Jeremiah that God called him to be a prophet unto the nations. Mm -hmm. That's a different level. If I'm going to give a word to the United Kingdom, it would be wise for me, if, especially if I'm going to release that word on a digital platform, to get some consult with other senior leaders to say, hey, here's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling a word of rebuke to the prime minister of the United Kingdom. Do you think it's wise that I put it out this way? Is there anything in this word you see that stands out to you, that troubles you? And I began to see this emerging prophet who had a, a great gift would bypass all of that, release these extremely controversy driven mm -hmm. words. And um, guess what? Their followers would go up and this became a process. And eventually they had a huge crash in their ministry because of a lack of wisdom. And it was my my spiritual uh, discernment and sense in the early days that they were operating from a place of brokenness. Mm -hmm. I believed that about 50 percent of the dreams were soulless dreams. They were not God dreams. What do I mean by that? If you sit around and watch MSNBC all day, you're going to get a perspective. You watch Fox News all day, you're going to get a perspective. And if you obsess over these perspectives, it's oh. quite normal that you go to sleep and you have a dream. But that doesn't mean the dream you had is the word of the Lord. And you can oh, no. release that stuff and people will respond to it. But oh, if you're yeah. immature, if you're broken and you're getting a lot of affirmation, it can become very unhealthy. And so I can remember having these conversations, but again, the person I'm speaking of did not heed it. And I think these are lessons for many of you that are watching. I really love the part um, about the soul and the negativity. You know, I think one challenge as a prophet is if every word you ever get, and I've dealt with people like this, and this is one of the most frustrating groups of prophetic people to deal with when you're trying to build that every word they have about any person is negative. You know, everybody's demonized, everybody's in witch. air, everybody's a witch. And it makes it so challenging because if you're trying to build, as you know, you're trying to mine the golden people. You, you do need, um, you do need to have times where it's like, okay, this is a serious warning. This person is going to come into your circle, cause a lot of trouble. But how do we, I guess my question is, 
how do we navigate it? So if we're listening to this and we're saying, Hey, I've done some of these things, or I tend to go on the negative side prophetically. How do we navigate this into a place of healing? What advice would you give to us? I do a training with prophets. That's often, um, very uncomfortable for them. I mean, if, if I was doing it to myself, it would be uncomfortable. But I, one of the exercises that I use, I try to teach them how to learn to separate their emotions and triggers. Because sometimes what you discern about somebody isn't spiritual at all. They may smell like or, or look like somebody who did you wrong in uh, another stage in life. And so you they're, they're, that small reminder triggers you in your mind, will, and emotion. But one exercise that I use to train prophets um, is I, I encourage them. I say, hey, I want you to take a few days to pray and I want you to write out a positive prophetic word for your greatest offender. Mm. Prophesy what the how the Lord could because the truth is just because you're upset with somebody doesn't mean that God is upset with somebody. So you've got to learn how to separate that emotion to be able to discern uh, through the word of God. The Bible says in Hebrews that the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, cutting between joint and marrow, soul and spirit. It's a line of the, the word is a line of delineation. It, it's a um, it helps you uh, uh, discern what's God and what's your flesh, what's spirit and what's soul. And so what I encourage them to do through this, uh, um, through this exercise is say, um, what's the positive word for your greatest offender? How does God want to bless your greatest offender? I want you to record it and it has to be more than two minutes. I stretch them and I, I say, you got to go past how you feel, pray in the spirit, get connected to the mind of God because uh, uh, Proverbs tells us that the thoughts that God thinks towards his people are innumerable. So he's thinking something good towards the person that you hate. You've just got to tap into it. And that's hard, but it's one of the greatest exercises that I learned because once I started asking God questions about the people who hurt me, I started asking God questions like, how do you want to bless them? What did you create mm. them for? What, what are their, what, how are you pleased with them? Even though I'm not pleased with them, how are you pleased with them? Asking God that, and you're able to tap into the mind of God. When you're able to, to stretch past that, that your surface level defense, your, cause your soul is the way that you relate to the world. So if your soul is unhealthy and it's not, your spirit isn't stronger than your soul or your flesh isn't stronger than your, or your spirit. Uh, flesh is stronger than your spirit, then that's the way you're going to relate. Even if God gives you an authentic word, it's going to be twisted by your negative perspective. But if you take time to um, submit your will, align your mind, balance your emotions, they're not, a, they're not a compass, they're a gauge, they don't lead you, they show you where you have unmet needs, unhealed hurts, and unresolved issues. When you learn to place those things in proper perspective, then you can separate, okay, I don't like this person. And I've had this case. There have been times where I have been that prophet to apostles. I have been like, look, this person, I don't like them. This is me, Taurus, not liking them. I have no reason not to like them. I don't know why I don't like them, but this is the word of the Lord. God says you're to use them like uh, Jesus utilized Judas. He knew who he was. He knew who, what he was going to do, but he utilized his skill set for a season to advance his ministry. Use them as scaffolding. Don't try to make them a um, concrete foundation. And that wisdom to leaders gave them a different perspective. OK, this person might not be a son or daughter, but I can benefit from the connection for a season if I maintain the right perspective. I'm sorry I, that was too long, but. No, no, I love it. I think you just gave such a masterful uh, answer to that. And I want, again, everybody that's watching, listen, we're building up to my annual prophetic class, SPI Sears and Prophets Intensive. It's happening April 28th through the 30th. But the thing that's different about it, two things really. Number one, it's live this year. However, if you're in a different time zone, you'll get access to replay. Uh, secondly, it is literally the most affordable class I've ever given on this uh, subject because I wanted to do it different this year. I wanted to get as many of you in it as possible. However, time is limited. So you've got to go to www.lgi, that stands for the Strange Global Institute, www.lgi.institute to register. Prophet Torres will be with me. Jennifer LeClaire will be with me. Yolanda Perry, who's an entrepreneur and one of my spiritual daughters, will be with me. Uh, we are talking about the Solutionist Edition. So 
prophets are being brought forth. Prophetic authors are being brought forth. Prophetic entrepreneurs are being brought forth. Yes. Uh, prophetic pastors are being brought forth in this season, not to be a bitter, wounded person who's sidelined, but to be a Joseph. There's a reason why Joseph was called upon by Pharaoh. Yes. Because Joseph had solutions when others only had problems. There's a reason why David was skilled enough to defeat Goliath. Everybody else saw opposition. David saw opportunity. You know, the difference between David and everybody else was very simple. It was perspective. Yes. And what we're talking about with bitterness, with woundedness, with anger, with offense, we're talking about perspective. So we are going to be shifting your perspective. You're going to get about six classroom hours of teaching. Plus, if you do the VIP, you get some bonus stuff uh, to just like this broadcast, but in depth there. You're going to have I think they've commissioned somebody to do visual notes where they draw out the things we're describing and talking about. It. You're going to get all of that, but you have to register at www.lgi. Dot institute. Um, so listen, you've given us so many nuggets. I, I guess let's kind of begin to wrap up here. Uh, what did we leave out that you say like, hey, I've got to get this in about healthy profits versus unhealthy? Um, I, I really want to encourage um, healthy profits. I want to encourage unhealthy profits to seek community. It's probably, and I'm I'm not just talking about getting in a company of prophets or, or or getting under an apostle. I'm talking about really finding authentic community and and have a place where you can confess, have a place where you can open your mouth and talk about what you're really going through. Because the prophet's greatest spiritual warfare is mental warfare, and if you don't have um, have things in place to take care of your soul, it will affect your assignment. Sometimes the things that we feel like are, are, are spiritual or the enemy warring against us is actually the enemy warring from within us. And so we need to make sure that prophets, prophetic people are, are getting the de regular deliverance. I get deliverance uh, once a year, sometimes twice. Um, 2020, I got it twice. I needed it twice. <laughs> but uh, but also therapy. Do not just lean on what happens in a moment at an altar. You've gone through so much in your life, dear prophet. And please do not think that a few moments at the altar uh, every other Sunday are, are going to be enough. A lot of times it's not enough for us. Sometimes we need to seek out additional help. We need to seek out community. We need to seek out deliverance and therapy to make sure that we have a whole soul. So the whole word of God comes out without any of our nasty filters, without any of our our, our brokenness to, to, to taint and water down the word. So please make sure that you're taking care of you. Healthy prophets are prophets who take care of themselves. I think that's brilliant. And listen, here's a really interesting question. I, I've been asked this and answered it numerous times, but since I've got you, Maurice writes, would you guys consider the prophets that Trump are going to do two terms unhealthy or led by their political perspective? Before you answer, let me say this. I it was interestingly enough with somebody who was in that group of prophets recently, and they told me behind the scenes, some of their team and staff still feel like, hey, we got it right, but some things went haywire here. So it was interesting for me to hear that because that's still kind of being talked about. I know my opinion, but what is your opinion on that question? Um, I think because they allow their political aspirations to lead them, they are unhealthy. I, as I said, prophets have to remember that their loyalty is ultimately to the Lord. Yes, Sozo is great. I see that comment. Um, I believe their um their political aspirations and their their political perspectives made them like the lying spirit that made them like the lying spirit in the old testament where uh, god said well who will go for me and a spirit said i'll go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets i think they were susceptible to that and they gave agreement to that because of their um driven political perspective about it and and no they didn't get it right you know they they flat out said he would he would get two terms and sadly or gladly depending on what side of the aisle you're on he did it so i think i think we just have to be willing to call a thing a thing apologize healthy prophets apologize you are i remember i prophesied in 20 20, first part of January 2020. This was before COVID. And I prophesied and I said, I see an outbreak of tuberculosis. I called it. 
tuberculosis. It was, I was in Life Center at Atlanta, Atlanta Dr. Mary and Buddy Crone. I see, I see an outbreak of tuberculosis that's going to take the nation, take the world by surprise. I came back and apologized because I said, you know what? I called it tuberculosis because that's that's who has language for COVID-19, right? Right, right, right. But be willing to say, hey, I was wrong on this. Forgive me, because if it had truly been tuberculosis, then they would there's a vaccine for it. But because it looked like it and I didn't understand, I needed to apologize and be accountable for my words. Those people who don't want to be accountable for their words and still try to make the world like it's just in an off reality, it's just it's unhealthy. Yeah. And, and it's interesting while you're talking, there's people arguing in the comments and it is so fascinating, y'all, because I think one of the issues with uh, political things is idolatry that we make human beings idolatrous. Let's remember one thing. Let's remember that God actually never intended for Israel to have a king. The, the implementation of a king happened because of the heart of Israel. So the fact that y'all want to argue <laughs> facts, like it's factual, it's factual. So let's say the election was stolen. That's not, you know, if, if that's a theory we're floating, if God that created the heavens and the earth said, this is how it's going to be, he knew and understood that. So if we Word were getting accurate, Lord. right, if we were getting accurate prophetic information, it probably would have been to pray about that. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be mean spirited y'all, but this is the thing. If I prophesied, I, well, let me give an example. I remember counseling a pastor, a female pastor in a very rural area of America. She did a prophetic activation and there was a woman whose mother was sick. One of the brand new activated uh, prophetic people went up to the mother, the woman and said, Lord said, he's going to heal your mother. The mother dies. Mm. Now the pastor calls me because she's got a big mess on her hands. And I said, you have to understand your value system. If your value system is the prophetic, this kind of stuff's going to happen. And we have to go through it and we have to understand why did I see this perspective? And I said, what she probably saw was the mother going to heaven, but the way her mind filtered that because of compassion for this woman was mm -hmm. God's going to heal this mother. So you just have to address it that way. And I think this is one of the things. And so for y'all that want to keep arguing this stuff, it's actually going to limit your ability to minister effectively because here's the thing. Idolatry says I'm going to put this thing or this person before the Lord. Prophets are going to minister to people on any side of the aisle. There are prophets that could be in the middle of this crisis in Russia, be sent to Russia to prophesy to Vladimir Putin because they represent the kingdom of God. They may think he's a horrifically twisted individual, but if the Lord fills their mouth with a word for him, they have to be able to do that. And so these discussions, I think, are very, very helpful. And I would challenge those of you that are arguing if your immediate reaction to this, this that part of the combo is anger. You might want to let the Lord examine your heart. Why am I angry? And it could be because we're doing what Israel did, that we want a king instead of wanting the Lord. I recognize we have political leaders, right? And God has opinions about that and God has input on that. But I think we need to be able to handle this conversation without getting stirred as some of y'all are getting stirred. So I think that's important. I love the point that was made about your soul, your soul becoming healthy. That's going to help you so much. That's going to help you to be uh, a stronger contributor into the local church. Um, let me say this. I was at a prophetic gathering um, pre-COVID. And I will be really honest with you. Some of the leading prophets in America were there. It was in essence a political rally. It was not, I was, this was private. It was not, the Lord is saying this, the Lord said, there was some of that, but there was a huge, huge, huge amount of inflection of ideology that was very personal. And I recognized that there was nobody in that company allowed to express a thought that was different than the thoughts that were being expressed. And one of the dangers, in my opinion, that have led to the prophetic climate and political climate today is that we have fused our political ideology with our prophetic anointing. And we've not had a full spectrum of people uh, to say, wait a minute, the Lord has shown me something different. I think it's very healthy in a prophetic community when there are people who have different perspectives. I recognize God has a final word, right? But I'm saying that if you have a different way you see the world, if I'm gathering with prophets from Europe, they by nature have a different cultural perspective than maybe if I'm gathering from prophets from America. Go ahead, yeah. Prophet Tours. And you know, I think sometimes we've we've put an unhealthy pressure on prophets. Thank God we don't we don't 
strictly judge prophets the way we judge them in the Old Testament. Because Deuteronomy said, if they gave a word and it don't come to pass, stone them. Because they're not prophets of God. Thank God we we live under grace. We don't we don't we don't do that anymore. But I think one thing we we put an unfair pressure on prophetic people. Everybody's not going to prophesy about what's going on politically. Everyone shouldn't prophesy. There are different metrons, spheres of influence. I don't often prophesy about politics unless I like no like I, I prophesied in January. I said uh, the Lord showed me an opening in the Supreme Court. Justice Department. I don't know if this is going to be a, a, a by death or resignation, but I know the Lord showed me. And that's all I gave him because that's all I had. You know, I think we have to allow prophets to not live under the pressure to perform. I think we make sometimes the church or the Christian community makes we put prophets up on a pedestal. Then we put this pressure on them to perform and to give information that they might not be wired to talk about. You want to know what I prophesy most about? The church. Because yeah. that's what I'm called to. That's what I'm designed for. That's what God is, has built me uh, built to, to, to be a part of and, and to have influences. Every prophet that you see on social media is not called to prophesy about the state of uh, the United States government. That's just not. Now, there's a pressure to do that. And unhealthy prophets will lean into that pressure. And when they lean into that pressure, they'll sometimes find themselves in embarrassing positions. Yeah, you know, there was a prophet who, who passed away during the pandemic. He actually passed away from COVID. And his name was R. Lauren Sanford. And he gave a word about a second he uh, Trump term. He passed. Yes, he did. Oh, wow. And he came out. And, and I can confirm what he said because, again, I was in a private meeting where I saw this firsthand. He came out and said, look, the first election the Lord told me this was the word. This was what was going to happen. He said the second election, I felt an unhealthy pressure and I got swept up in the atmosphere and the pressure of it. And he was very transparent. And I thought it was so good because I had seen and observed this privately. Um, and I can tell you all who've not been in some of these spaces who get mad at me and others are talking about it. I've been in these private spaces and I've seen some really unhealthy things. And I had seen that and I re recognized uh, what he was saying to be true. So I love that point. Prophets, uh, you're going to be called the different spheres and metrons. We talk about the apostolic, there's spheres and metrons. So again, guys, I hope this conversation's helped you. I want to encourage all of you, if you need teaching like this, Please register for our class. Go to www.lgi.institute. It's happening April 28th to the 30th. It's three days, about six hours of classroom teaching. It will be live, but you can join the replay as well. So, Prophet Taurus, I'm going to give you the final word. Any last thoughts? And then when you get done, would you just pray for us? No, uh, I, I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of uh, Sears and Prophets Institute this year. I'm uh, excited about, I believe that the church is going through reformation. And I believe uh, the reformation that we're experiencing is going to bring uh, true, healthy, prophetic voices um, to a place of, of leadership, not to be decision makers, but to be advisors, to help those decision makers um, build empires for God, not just in his name, but for him. Um, so I, I, I love each and every one of you. Um, you can connect with me on Instagram, any way you want to connect with me. Um, but I, I want to pray for you. Father, thank you so much for each and every person on this live. Thank you that you said in your word that the seeing eye and the hearing ear come from you. So I just pray now, Father, that skills would be removed from their eyes, that uh, that their ears would be circumcised to hear you, to see you at a new level. Father, we thank you that we will be bound to the obedience of Christ, that we will only do what we see our Father do. We will only say what we hear our Father say. We say, Lord, we submit to you like Samuel did. Here we are, Lord. Use us. Speak to us. Uh, open us up. I pray, Father, that every person that's been under a brass heaven, every person that's been under uh, 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 in a season of deafness and hasn't felt like they could hear you, I pray that today, Father, they would move into a new dimension of your of, of your voice, Father, that they would hear you at another way. They would hear you in another way and hear you at another level, that you would uh, that you would migrate them into the place where you called them to be. You said in your word, you do nothing in the earth without fir first warning your servants to prophets. So I thank you that you're allowing that thing to be uh, embedded into their soul. You're and then allowing that thing to be embedded into their spirit so they will know your heart, know your mind, know your intentions and move thereof. Father, I thank you that love and and light will be their portions. Love because you told us to love ourselves as um, 
love others as we love ourselves. And you told us that uh, that we should love the Lord God with all our hearts. So thank you for love being a part of our narrative. And thank you, Jesus, that you're the light of the world. And you said that we are the light of the world, a city to be sit on the head. So Father, sit on a hill that not be hid. So Father, I thank you that you're uh, awakening that in us and you're stirring that in us so that we can be true examples of kingdom citizenship. In Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. I mean, thank you again, guys. Register at www.lgi.institute. Go follow Prophet Taurus on Facebook, on Instagram. He's got many powerful things coming up. And do us a favor, just share this broadcast if you would. I see all the comments. Thank you for the love. Share the broadcast and get registered for the class, and we'll see you all there. I'll be continuing these conversations next Tuesday. Prophet Taurus, thank you. Thank you, Apostle. Love you. Love you. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. Appreciate you.